So uh, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, web apps of the future. Um, so I kind of uh, noticed uh, just from talking to people here and from talking to um, some of the speakers at dinner last night that um, whenever you talk about um, web apps of the future, you end up talking about the web versus native apps. I think that um, a lot of times this debate is framed in terms of open versus closed or even good versus evil. Um, and I think, you know, I think we all here would agree that uh, the web should win, obviously, right? The web is obviously good, right? Um, uh, but, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I wanted to kind of break that down a little bit and kind of think about, like, you know, well, why should the web win? What, what exactly are the web's advantages? And kind of think more deeply about this question. So, you know, let's, let's, get, let's talk about some of the basics. So, the web is better because it's, um, well, has some advantages in terms of um, actual functionality. Uh, and it's also more fun and more open. So what do, what do I mean by better? Well, the web has URLs, links, right? Um, you can link to any page just by um, copying the URL from your browser. It's a very nice feature. Um, no installation is needed to view a web app. You just visit a, a site and um, uh, you visit a, a link and then the app is there. And you have the ability to push updates instantly without going through an app store approval process. Now, some of these advantages are actually going away. Um, some of the native platforms are actually getting this kind of stuff. So we have deep linking now in native apps. Um, and uh, some of the app stores are doing things to like slim app bundles. And just from you know talking to um, some some uh, the other speakers last night, it, it sounds like you know it, it sounds like this is kind of going towards eventually apps might not need installations. Um, we can you know they, they might get it to a point where no installation is needed. And so, as a web developer, I kind of feel like you know darn like I kind of want the web to win, and I don't want native apps to get better, right? But that's kind of that's kind of odd because it's good for users. So it's it's this interesting dichotomy that I'm, I'm, I've struggled to kind of figure out. Do I want to do I want users to have a better experience, or do I want the platform that I like to win? Uh, and uh, I think that um, you know there are, there are other things like the web. You know, is more fun. So this is these are you know more advantages of the web. Um, it's easier to learn. I think a lot of us learned how to code um, and how to make websites just by viewing source, uh, and that's a really nice feature that the web has. It's easier to build mashups. And honestly, just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are really fun. And it's also more open in some sense. You know, you have open standards. You have a standards process that, in theory, um, you know, you can you can go on a mailing list and you can share your opinion. And you can have input into the process. And the standards aren't controlled by a single company, so it's controlled by like four companies, <laughs> uh, which is better in some sense, I guess. Um, but uh, you know, native apps also have their advantages. Um, they tended to work better offline in the past. Um, they're more discoverable. Um, you get push notifications, and they've uh, tended to have better performance. And you know, when we talk about this dichotomy, it comes down to you know, this is just a question of like, you know, whichever side you come down on. It's just a question of how do you want to build your app? What kind of you know values do you um, think are important? Uh, what kind of culture do you want to build at your company? Um, and, and sometimes it just comes down to pragmatism. Like sometimes you just need to do a native app to you know, satisfy a client or to um, use some feature of the, of the phone, uh, of, of the mobile platform that you can't access from the web currently. Um, but you know, we want the web to win. Um, we want the web to get better. And um, we, you know, this is kind of just a given in our community that we want the web to, to, to get better. But when you really think about it, like what does this actually give to the user? I've been thinking, you know, thinking about this, and I couldn't really come up with a really good answer. It seems like a lot of the benefits of the web are, are mainly for developers. Like, do, these, do, do the benefits of the web that we just talked about actually benefit users? Some of them do. Um, but like a lot of the, like the things like the deep linking are, are going to be um, starting to become available in native apps. So what actually does the web have over native apps? And should we really care so much about the difference between the two? I don't know. So you know, it, it seems like users don't actually care that much. If you look at adoption of mobile apps versus uh, mobile web, you'll see that like, this is data from, from 2011 to 2012. 
you know, apps are killing it. We all know this. Here's, here's more recent data from uh, 2013 to 2014. You see that both, uh, both mobile web and mobile apps grew, but mobile apps grew a lot faster. So, you know, I was thinking about it just as a user when I'm deciding what apps I want to use and what, what software I want to run on, on my phone and on my computer, what do I actually care about? It turns out, at least for me, I actually don't care whether it's mobile, mobile web or, or a native app. I just don't care. What I care more about is whether the app is centralized versus decentralized. So this seems to matter a lot more to you know, my experience as a user. So this, this debate of centralized versus decentralized is often framed in similar terms to web versus native, you know, it's open versus closed networks, or good versus evil systems. And so it, um, it's, it's an equally kind of heated, uh, passionate debate as, as web versus uh, uh, native. But, um, you know, when you kind of uh, think about what you as a user get when you install an app, you're kind of buying into all of the developer's values and the way that the developer built that app. And so that's something that um, at least I care a lot about. So I wanted to talk, uh, I wanted to, like, let's, let's, let's kind of compare kind of the the centralized apps versus the decentralized apps and kind of talk about what you would get from one or the other. I think that'll help us kind of frame this a little bit. So, you know, centralized apps are apps where you, you typically have like a, a server and a client. So you have, you know, it's a website basically, uh, or, or it could be a native app. Um, but, but every website is pretty much designed this way, centralized. So it's simple and fast to build. We, all the tools that we pretty much use are, are designed to support this kind of way of building apps. And it's really, really easy to make money on these kinds of apps because you have um, you know, clear points of control that you as the, as the creator of the app can exert over your users. So you can you know, decide tomorrow that you're gonna show ads to your users. You can decide that you're going to you know, change your terms of service to disallow certain behavior that you don't like and, and so on and so forth. It's also really easy to get funding for these kinds of apps from venture capitalists because they understand uh, how, you know, how they work and they understand there's many examples in the past of, of apps working out this way really well for the VCs. There's a lot of pressure pushing you toward building an app this way. Not so much for the decentralized apps. But they have a lot of nice properties. So often decentralized apps will be censorship resistant. They'll preserve users' privacy and they'll put the user in control of their own data, and they're safe against user hostile changes by the developer of the app. So, you know, in the, in the worst case, if users don't like the way that an app has changed, in a, de in a decentralized system, you can build an alternate client and just do things differently. So, you know, um, there are a bunch of examples of, of apps that are decentralized. You've probably heard of a few of these, or maybe all of them, um, so there's, there's privacy-preserving apps like Tor, I2P, and Freenet, which um, try to allow you to browse content uh, as anonymously as possible. There's uh, things like Bitcoin and other blockchain-related apps. BitTorrent lets you do you know, file transfer, and you have BitMessage, which is kind of like an email alternative. It's not really that popular, but um, it's, um, it, if you use BitMessage, you can you know, send, send emails to people and uh, you get this nice um, property of uh, metadata um, uh, uh, secrecy. So any observer can't tell who you're emailing um, and, uh, and that's kind of nice because that's, very few systems give you that. And then there's like PGP, um, which uh, you know, is, is, is another um, way to do email securely. But, but all these systems, you know, are kind of, well, they're all native apps. <laughs> all of these things are implemented as native apps. And as a web developer, I kind of I wonder, like, why? Why can't we build these kinds of things on the web? I want to be able to offer users some of, some of these advantages and do it um, in a way where they can just go to a URL and, and have, have this experience right away. I don't want to make them install an app. So it's kind of like... It, I've struggled to reconcile kind of the, the, the fact that 
you know, because I'm a proponent of the web and particularly WebRTC, but then I see that like most web apps, actually the way they're designed don't really um, re respect the user in the way that I, I, would, I would like them to. So I think that what you see with all of these, the apps that we just talked about, the decentralized ones, is that they've managed to kind of change the game when it comes to control. So the, the, the developer of the app doesn't actually exert control over the user in the same way that they would in a centralized app. They've kind of um, uh, removed themselves from the picture in a way. Um, so like in centralized apps, you, you have um, a kind of a, a type of um, control that comes from, well, owning the domain name, right? Owning the servers that host the data, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's something when you're using an app you should think about is like, who owns the data? When you're building an app also, think about this. Who is actually the one who owns the data? Who runs the servers? And who has legal control? You know, who can change the terms and conditions on you? So these, these decentralized apps have managed to kind of remove themselves and eliminate middlemen. So if you think about like, what does is, what is Bitcoin do, right? It lets you send money to somebody without going through a middleman. You can send it directly to them. BitTorrent, I can send you a file and I don't need to use a third party service to get the file to you. I just directly connect to your computer and get the file from you, right? It's kind of the way it should be in some sense. It's kind of technically superior. Um, so, you know, and we, we all know that like when we use apps that aren't designed this way, that uh, the, the, the middlemen have this point of control over us and that allows them to turn us into the product if they want to. Now, you know, um, uh, you might be thinking that like, you know, yeah, this is all old stuff. Like, you know, this, you know, we, we all know that, that we're kind of making a deal with the devil um, when we use some of these, these products. But I kind of think, I kind of think like we don't have to make that deal. We can build, we can do better. I mean, we have the technology. We're starting to see some of that emerge. And that's kind of what I want to go into a little bit later in my talk. So we should question whether the control that a lot of these um, apps we use have over us is actually necessary for the app to function. Could we actually build a system that doesn't require that kind of control? And would it, would, could it be as, as good of an experience or better? Um, and, and do the apps that we use actually support the human values that we care about? So um, I actually like this quote a lot from my friend uh, Dominic Tarr. Uh, he said he wants to build a social network that is safe against future Dominic. So he wants to guarantee that if he turns evil in the future, and decides that he wants to do something with all of your data, he can't. He literally can't. He's technically prevented from doing so by the design of the, of the network. So he's working on this right now. He has a, a project that um, he developed this protocol called Secure Scuttlebutt, and he's building a, you know, an app to, to allow people to use this. It's kind of a cool idea. So you might think that if you know the people who've developed the web app that you use or the, the app that you use, uh, and, you th and you think that they're good people, that that's, that somehow s protects you or saves you from the kind of some of these downsides that I'm, I've talked about. But the truth is that you know, companies can go public and companies can be acquired. I had a company that was acquired um, and that, that really changes things. Um, companies uh, take VC funding. Um, companies have to then become profitable in order to get the next round of VC funding and make sure that their employees um, that they've hired on the basis of that first round of funding can continue to have a job and so they don't have to lay people off. So it puts them on this treadmill where there's these increasing competitive pressures to make money and um, you know, we, when they have this control, they're gonna, do, they're gonna end up going to certain um, lengths to, to make the money that they need to make to survive. Um, and, you know, and, and leadership changes, so even if you know the people who are running a company or running an app, that's no guarantee that they're going to be there tomorrow running the app. So, um, pr you know, promises are, the thing about promises is that they can, is that they can be broken. Um, so, just, just remember that. Um, and I, I wanted to read a quote from um, Brewster Kahl, the founder of the Internet Archive, that I thought was really um, relevant here. So he said, one of my heroes, Larry Lessig, famously said that code is law. The way we code the web will determine the way we live online. 
So we need to bake our values into our code. Freedom of expression needs to be baked into our code. Privacy should be baked into our code. Universal access to all knowledge should be baked into our code. But right now, those values are not embedded into the web. So why doesn't the web reflect these values? I think there are a lot of reasons, um, but I think, um, I mean, we could talk about some of the reasons. So, you know, web apps are trapped in the browser. You have domain names and, 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 uh, and DNS, which, you know, by the way, I should uh, side note really quickly. So DNS, uh, it's, um, it's a distributed system, but it's not decentralized system. So um, what I kind of mean by that is like, um, there's like this, there's many definitions of these terms, but one that I find really useful is, a distributed system is a system where you have many computers cooperating with each other. Um, and a decentralized system is one where you have many indep independent people cooperating with each other. So think about like a Google data center. That's a distributed system. But all the computers are controlled by one person. And that person you know, th th is, is Google. And Google knows that all those servers um, are behaving correctly or behaving, you know, um, they're not actively malicious at the very least. But in a decentralized system, you don't have any such guarantees. So when you're building a decentralized system, you actually have to solve all the problems of the dis distributed system, which is how to get multiple computers to work together. And you have to do that um, while a you know, bunch of those computers could be malicious and actually trying to, to take advantage of the network. So it's a way harder problem. So domain names and DNS kind of have, you know, they're, they're distributed all around, but they have, they're, they're, they're pretty controllable. You know, so d domain names and DNS are regularly interfered with. If you read the news, you, you, know, you, you see all the time that like, they're interfered with in the name of you know, preserving uh, the copyright monopoly or you know, censoring political thoughts in, in certain countries um, or you know, various other reasons. Um, and, uh, and so you know, uh, I think we can do better. And the, another, another limitation of the web is actually one of its, its strengths. So the URL is actually a limitation. Because so URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator, right? So it, it describes the location of a resource. Um, the thing is that that resource could move to a different location in the future. That resource could disappear from the original location. And so really what you want is not location-based addressing, but content-based addressing. So if someone in the world has the content that you want, you should be able to get it, no matter where it is. Um, and so that's, that's called content-based addressing, and that's the basis of a lot of systems like uh, BitTorrent, for example. Um, so these are just some of the limitations, but I think the biggest limitation is the client-server model. So um, unlike peer-to-peer -peer systems, in a client-server model, the client is delegated, or is, is, is um, kind of reduced to a role of, of being subservient to the server. And that's really nice if you're in control of the server. As a developer, it gives you a lot of control and it makes things really simple. Because you can kind of make the clients do whatever you want. But I, think it's, I just think it's really interesting that the internet started out actually as a peer-to-peer -peer system. When you, when you open a TCP socket to somebody, you know, you're just a peer and they're just another peer that happens to be listening on a certain interface and you just connect to them and you're, you're equals, right? The, 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 the part where one of the peers becomes kind of uh, weaker in this relationship happened afterwards with the advent of the web. So the web was designed this way. Um, so, you know, and here's the like obligatory picture of the difference between client server and peer to peer. This is client server and this is peer to peer, right? Um, yeah, so the, the, I guess the end game of all this is just, I, I became really interested in thinking about this question. Who does your code serve? So what values does your code promote? So as, as builders of the web, I think that we can do better. And we can, as, as new web standards develop, we can kind of make sure that they reflect our values in this area. And there's the beginnings of a solution starting to emerge, I think. Um, and that's what I wanted to spend the remaining part of this talk talking about. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, so there are actually some uh, in, you know, really interesting uh, beginnings of, of potential solution to this. And I think that comes in the form of these technologies, WebRTC, service workers, web crypto, and replicating databases. So. 
let's talk about um, web crypto. So, you know, actually, it, this is kind of a tangent, but I think it's really interesting how these technologies get developed and who, and who initially kind of pushes for the specs. So web crypto came from, um, I know that Netflix was involved in, um, in working on it because they wanted to be able to do HTML5 video and, and DRM protect the video. Um, but now it's having all these uses and building these peer-to-peer -peer apps and these decentralized apps, so it's really, it's just kind of an unintended consequence. And WebRTC is the same way as well. Um, so yeah, so I have one example I want to show you guys of service workers and web crypto being used in a really interesting way, and it's called Hyperboot. It was created by Substack from the Node.js community, and I'll demo that now. So what he's built is a way to, can you guys all see this? Cool. What he's built here is a way to um, version a web app. So what happens is when you visit this app here, this is just a simple app. Um, by the way, is anyone here um, epileptic? Serious question, because otherwise I won't click the button up here. <laughs> okay, I won't do it then. Yeah, so this is just, this, <laughs> this is just this, his demo app, which is unfortunately uh, kind of uh, unfriendly <laughs> to some people. But this is the demo app, and um, it, you can, it, it's a very simple um, uh, uh, JavaScript application. And um, what's really, what's unique about it is that um, whenever the app is accessed, it gets permanently cached in the user's browser forever. Um, and this was, this was actually built before uh, service workers existed. So it uses um, app cache, and it uses this um, clever trick, which some people think is actually a bug, but it's actually really useful. So you know in your manifest file, when you're doing app cache, you, you list out all the URLs that you want the browser to cache. Well, if you, it turns out if you, um, so if you list a bunch of files, right, the browser will regularly refetch the manifest to see if it's changed and you want it to cache different URLs now. But if you include the manifest file itself, the URL to the manifest file in the manifest file, then the browser will never refetch anything ever again. It just permanently makes your, your website just like never, never changing, unchanging. <laughs> so. Uh, you can actually, it's actually really bad if you accidentally do that um, and ship it on an app that you want to update. But if you're trying to build secure apps, it actually gives you a really interesting property. You can cache an app forever, and that means that, that you can't, in the future, change the app to be worse. And if you get clever about it, you can, you can do this in a way where you can still ship new versions, but give users control over whether they want to use the new version. So um, you can, instead of caching your app itself, you can cache um, a hypervisor, like a, like a bootloader, kind of like what, we, what you would use if you're you know, using a VM system and you're running many, many kind of machines. Basically, it's a small bit of code that's very short, and so it's auditable, and you can pretty reasonably you know, know that it's secure. That gets cached, and then what that does is it can fetch um, a manifest that shows what versions of your app are available. And whenever a new one becomes available, it can prompt the user to upgrade to it if they want to. So let's see what this looks like. So there's a little handy button here that you can push to open up this little sidebar here. And you can see I'm running the latest version of the app, 2.0.0, and it says saved, which means that this, this is forever on my browser until I decide to clear my um, local um, data, right? So the developer can't revoke this version of the app. Um, and I can go back to older versions if I want to. So this version doesn't have the configuration button anymore because that was released in 2.0. I can keep going back to older versions. And you can see how the app change, has changed over time. And um, I don't know, I just think this is really cool. I mean, imagine the possibility of like, you know, let's say some company like Facebook ships an update and they're like, you know, this is the new Facebook. And you're like, actually, I kind of like the old one. You can just use the old one, right? Now, if there are API endpoints that are changing, then the old app might not work anymore. So this is why we have to build our app to be peer-to-peer um, -peer in more ways than, you know, it's not, it's not enough to just make the app offlineable in this way. You have to design it to be more robust um, and more peer-to-peer -peer throughout. But this is, this is the start. This is, this, is, this is just a start. Um, so I think it's pretty cool. Now, with this, you can actually take it a step further. And um, he, he's also gone and built this thing called Keyboot which um, actually is like a sign-on identity service that's built on top of Hyperboot. 
So you can generate an identity. This is obviously too technical for a normal user. This is like, this needs to be, the, the UX needs to be improved. But what we've done here is I've created an account. And now um, you can see here that um, these are applications that I've authorized to use my identity and all the data associated with it. And um, I, I couldn't find the, the link to, um, to actually make an app off here, so I'm sorry. But um, what you would do is go to an app and then you click a login button. And you could even be offline, completely offline. And what would happen is clicking login in one app over here would make a request come through here on this domain. And, bo and since both apps can be offline, you can actually log into an app while you're offline using your identity that's in your browser here. And then that app can actually do really interesting things, like it could say, I want to um, sign a message to prove that it's from me, for us. And it can ask this Keyboot app to do that for it. And Keyboot can do that without giving the private key over to that app, which is pretty cool. Anyway, so that's just like one thing that I think is pretty cool. Um, but there's more. So there's um, the, thing, the project I've been working on called WebTorrent which uh, is kind of another piece of the puzzle. So we have offline ability of apps now, and we can permanently cache them. But um, how do we get data between peers? So we have WebRTC for that. Um, and WebTorrent uses WebRTC to make BitTorrent work in the browser. So it's true peer-to-peer. -peer. So if, if I want to send a file to you using WebTorrent, I'm actually connecting directly to you. That's what WebRTC uh, gives us. And um, it has some nice things like you can stream the files that you get from other people into a video tag or an audio tag or VLC or Chromecast or AirPlay or whatever you have. Um, um, that's kind of cool. Um, so I don't want to get too much into the code, but I wanted to just show you how easy it is to share files using WebTorrent. So this is assuming you're using something like Browserify to require node modules. You can just require WebTorrent require a drag and drop library and say when um, the user drops a file onto the body of the page, uh, I want to take those files and start to seed them uh, with client.seed. And then uh, once that's happened, I'll be able to pull out the magnet link for that torrent and I can send that to somebody and they can download it. So how do you download files with WebTorrent? Well, just as easy. You just call client.add and you pass in the magnet link. You'll be given a torrent object, and there's a lot of information you can get on that, but the one we want is we want to pull out the first file of the torrent, because we know that it's a video, and then we want to play the video into, in, in a video tag, and we just say file.append to, kind of like jQuery. We just give it the uh, DOM selector that we want to play the video into, and it just works. The video doesn't even have to be made to play back in the browser, so it'll actually uh, do some repackaging of the MP4 file on the fly, which is madness, and it works. So um, I want to just demo that really quick, um, because I think it's, it's pretty quick and it's pretty cool. Um, so here's um, a demo app that shows it working. And I have a video file here. So I'm going to just drop it onto this page. And now it's called the client.seed function. So it's getting ready to seed this file. And this is a really big file. So it's actually going through, and it's uh, splitting it up into a thousand pieces. And it's hashing each piece. And it's creating a torrent file for it. Um, and now it's playing back to show me that it, it was able to process it. And I could uh, copy this little share link here and send it to a friend, and they would be able to um, visit uh, the site and play it back. But what I'm going to do instead of showing that, which uh, isn't, isn't that cool, I'm going to download a torrent file of it. And then I'm going to go to, um, there's this program here which uh, I have which um, I'm using a, a cutting edge version of it right now. So I'm, unfortunately, I have to run it from the command line. OK, this is called Playback. And this is a video player. It shows, it shows a cat when there's no video playing, just to kind of, well, I mean, why not, right? So um, you, can, you can play normal MP, MP4 files or whatever you want. Um, but we're going to actually take uh, the torrent file that we just downloaded from uh, Instant.io and drop it onto this player. And we'll see now that the page is actually seeding it to this torrent client, which can now play it back. So this is a native app talking to a web browser using WebRTC. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so as long as um, there are people who have this video open, the video will be available. And all you need to know is the magnet link to start to download it, or the, or the torrent file. It's pretty cool. Now, the other thing that's cool is um, that if this browser goes away, this browser tab goes away, um, I, can, I can still come back later, right? And I can, um, if I know the magnet link, I can just paste it in here and, and, and begin to download it. So this, kind of, this native app kind of serves as like a longer term seeder for the content, which is pretty cool. Maybe we'll wait a second for it to, to start to download. Maybe not. Hmm. Well, I'll, we'll come back to it in a second. Anyway, so yeah, it's really, uh, it's really kind of uh, simple in that way. There's also a command line program you can use if you want to um, stream it into VLC or something. It, anyway, point is, the point is that WebRTC, I think, is really interesting because it's kind of like, I think of it as kind of like a backdoor. So it was, it was created by uh, the, the people on the spec are all these companies that want to build video um, chat applications in the browser. So there's like, you know, there's going to be Skype in the browser. There's going to be, um, there's already Hangouts, as, Google Hangouts is based on WebRTC. But, um, you know, and, and it turns out that in order to build, build video chat apps that are really good, that have low latency, you need to do peer-to-peer -peer because you eliminate a round trip. You don't need to go to a server uh, and then to the user. So you get a really nice, uh, a huge improvement in, in call quality. So I don't, I mean, I, don't, I don't know too much about the motivations of the companies, but I would assume that they don't really care that much about peer-to-peer. -peer. Like, I don't think if you, if you went to you know, some standards body and said, let's build peer-to-peer -peer into the web, that they'd be like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. But it turns out it kind of came in through this, this back channel of trying to do video chat. And so I think we should use this opportunity. Um, and specifically, the part, the part of WebRTC that, is, that we're using here is called data channel. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not the video and voice part of it. It's uh, kind of like uh, it's a third part, um, which lets you send any data you want to the other peer, arbitrary data. So it has an API that's uh, very similar to WebSocket. Um, you just have send, and you have uh, data of, or message events when you get messages from the other side. Really straightforward. Um, so there's been a whole bunch of, uh, of unintended consequences from the data channel. Um, oh, there's a typo there. But um, there's, so there's, excuse me, there's peer-assisted delivery. Uh, so peer-CDN peer was my company. We were doing like a CDN where you just turned your site visitors into hosts of your content while they were on your page. There's file transfer things like WebTorrent. There's ephemeral site hosting. There's um, lots of potential for chat, email, and encrypted real-time communications apps. And I think really, if we build all future peer-to-peer -peer protocols on WebRTC, then they'll just work on the web out of the box. So you know, Bitcoin and BitTorrent were designed before WebRTC was a thing. But if they were designed today, and they were instead of using TCP or UDP as their underlying protocol, if they were to use WebRTC, then you'd have this really nice um, property where a browser and a native app could just talk to each other. And they're just equals in the system. Really powerful stuff. So um, I kind of demoed that already with the native app talking to the, the web browser. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the, oh, dang, this is small. OK. About how we can, so how Web, WebRTC Everywhere kind of works. So you, you know, it works in web apps, it works in desktop apps, it works in server apps and mobile apps. It's really quite universal. Um, and it's the only transport that works in the browser. So when you're building these kinds of decentralized apps, you have to you kind of have to use WebRTC as the transport to talk between the different peers in the system. It has a lot of nice properties, like you get NAT traversal for free. I know that a lot of us probably don't think about this very often, but whenever you connect to a Wi-Fi network, you have a, a, a NAT that kind of sits between you and the outside world and gives you private IPs that are different than the public IPs, and that really makes it really hard to do peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Um, and Fortunately, WebRTC just gives you that aspect for free. There's no um, same origin policy um, with WebRTC. So that means that an app on one domain can t talk to an app on another domain because they, would, they both need WebRTC code that's cooperating. So it's kind of assumed that those apps want to talk to each other. This means that any site that embeds the WebTorrent script, for example, can talk to any other site that has the WebTorrent script, which is, which is really powerful. And the, the transport hack has to have mandatory encryption, which is really nice. Uh, and like I said, the API is really, really easy. Um, it works in a lot of uh, 
browsers today. Um, Microsoft Edge is actually implementing it right now. Um, I think I saw some early bit of it that was working. Um, um, and Apple, I think, is going to implement it soon. There's been indications for a while that they're thinking about it, but of course they haven't commented yet. Um, now, um, the desktop app that I showed you that was using WebRTC was um, really interesting because it was implemented using Electron, um, which is uh, what the Atom editor uses. So you can actually build a native app using web technologies. And since, that, um, since, since Electron is really just running Chromium, you have access to a really good WebRTC implementation right in there. So you can build native apps that talk to browsers really simply um, just using Electron. Um, and there's also a way to use WebRTC on your, you know, in, in, on your server side um, using these various packages um, that are available. Um, same with uh, mobile apps. You can actually take the WebRTC library and compile it into your iOS apps. You can build um, apps that use WebRTC on iOS even though Safari doesn't support it. Um, and yeah, I think that um, it's really powerful to have the same code running in all these different places. So. I think um, what I want to do now is show one more thing, um, which is, unfortunately, the network's not cooperating with me here, but I want to show you an app that I'm working on um, with some friends. Um, it's called Friends. Um, it's, it's supposed to be kind of like a, a Slack clone, uh, but completely and as much as possible decentralized. So it's a really interesting challenge, you know, not just talking about these ideas, but actually trying to implement them in practice and seeing are they actually practical. So what we've managed to build, uh, and I have to launch it from the command line, unfortunately, <laughs> right now. What we've managed to build is this little app, which play, plays the Friends theme song when you open it up, um, and it's it's a pretty full featured. Um, Clone of, of Slack, so you can you can post like you can do like um, can you guys see this? Should I zoom in. Cool. So I can post things like headings. You know, there's markdown support. There's image support. Um, there's automatic link. You know, stuff. You can create little channels for whatever um, topics you want to discuss. And um, whenever someone else who's running this app joins the channel, um, you open up a peer-to-peer -peer connection to that person using WebRTC. And everything that's posted in the channel gets saved by all the users that are in the channel. So there's this append-only kind of log that everyone has of the channel history. And this means that um, when uh, new users join, they can connect to anyone and ask anyone to give them the history of the channel. Now, you might worry that the person that they connect to might give them a different history of the channel than what actually happened. But we can use um, simple things like signing messages to um, ensure that the messages can't be modified. So if you look here, you'll see a little green check next to my name. Um, and what we're doing now is we're actually using GitHub. Um, so GitHub has this, um, I wonder if I'll be able to remember the URL, but it's like GitHub slash, um, uh, you go to some URL and then you add .keys to the end. And so you can see here, this is um, this user Max Ogden. This is his, uh, the fingerprint of his public key. So for any GitHub user, you can actually find the fingerprint of their public keys by just going to this URL. And so what we've done is we've, we've kind of bootstrapped off of GitHub for this app. And so anything you post, we actually look at your SSH key on your computer and sign the message with that. And then um, anyone who gets the message can just go check GitHub and see, oh, is that actually that person? So it's not, it's not that user friendly, but it, it's possible here. You, and you can see. Um, and, uh, and then the other thing, of course, is, is it working in the browser? And um, of course, the answer is yes. So here's the same app working in the browser. Um, I can't show you them connected right now because I, I couldn't get it working in time for the talk. But um, anyway, there it is. Um, now, one other thing I want to mention that's kind of interesting is what happens if um, a user goes offline. So Alex was talking about this in his talk and about how, you know, what do you do when a user goes offline and they continue to post messages and then they come back online? Like, how do you show it? So um, there's, there's two aspects to that. One is how do you handle that at the data model level? And the other is um, how do you show it to the user? So at the data level, this is using an NPM module called Hyperlog. 
to, um, to, to, to implement this, this store. And the way it works is, every time you want to post a new message, you um, kind of um, point to the previous message, kind of like how Git works, um, and, you, and, you, and you, um, you point to the previous message and then you sign kind of a message that says like, okay, this is my message. And if two people do this at the same time, um, and um, they post at the same time, they'll both be pointing to the same message. So now you have a fork in your, in your data model, and that's okay, this tolerates that. And then the next time someone posts, they'll actually point to all the parents that they have and rejoin the tree. So you have this kind of model where the tree splits and then it rejoins and it splits and it rejoins. Um, and then now the question is, how do you render that to the user? Well, you can actually have different strategies. So what we decided to go with was if the message was posted um, within the last five minutes, then we'll just show it in the order that it was received, assuming that you know that's probably like the advantage of that is that the user will see um, this will see the message and it will be kind of reasonably close to the other messages. It has the iMessage problem, though, that Alex showed. But if it's older than five minutes, that means that the user probably went offline for a few hours or more, and we don't want to just dump those messages at the end. So what we do is we post them um, earlier in the feed, right where they belong, and then we show like a little yellow indicator in the scroll bar that says, like, oh, there are new messages that came in after, after the fact, and you can scroll up and see them if you want. So um, I'm glad Alex talked about that, because it's kind of cool. So in short, like, despite the challenges, I think that we should all rally around WebRTC and service workers, because they offer like, the best chance of making the web reflect our values uh, that, I, that I think we have. Um, and, we should, and we should continue to do more you know, beyond these as well. Um, we need more apps that respect and empower users, um, and you know, that don't uh, treat users as a, as a like a commodity or as something to be you know used to extract value, um, and I think we can we can do this. If you want to learn more about the projects that I talked about, you can visit um, hyperboot.org, uh, keyboot.org, webtorrent.io, or um, this GitHub page for the Friends app that we built. And um, yeah, I guess I think the ideal app is is peer to peer, offline, decentralized, um, because you know the ideal app would protect users from censorship. Um, the addition of if user hostile features and um, you know changes in, in company culture or or the business situation um, and yeah I want our I want our apps to kind of enshrine these values in a way that can't be um, changed so um, yeah thank you.